Welcome to the Sex and Psychology Podcast. My name is Dr. Justin Laymiller. I am a research fellow at the Kinsey Institute and author of the book, Tell Me What You Want, The Science of Sexual Desire and How It Can Help You Improve Your Sex Life. My guest today is Dr. Nan Wise, a cognitive neuroscientist, certified sex therapist, and associate research professor at Rutgers University. And we're gonna be talking about her new book, Why Good Sex Matters, which explores the role that sexual pleasure plays in our health and happiness, and helps readers understand how they can discover their own sexual potential. I can't wait for this conversation, and I'm sure you can't either. So let's get to it. Hi, Nan, thanks for joining me. Oh, I'm so excited about being here, Justin. I'm so glad to have you here. And I've been reading and following your work for years. And it seems like we should have met by now because the sex research community is a pretty small one, but somehow this is our first chat. So it's great to finally have the chance to talk to you. Same here. They didn't let me out of the lab very much. So I was (laughs) locked in the lab for about 10 years. Well, hopefully that changes and we start seeing each other a bit more. Good, 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 good. So before we dive into your book, can you tell us a little bit about your background and what led you to want to write this book and why you think it's important for us to read it at this particular point in time? Well, that's a great question, Justin. I was uh, born with a very excitable nervous system. My whole family has panic attacks as a rite of passage. So I really needed to understand and know a lot about how the nervous system works. And so I went off and became a therapist. I was always trying to learn about the brain. And once we had the tools to work with and study the working brain, it became possible, and my kids went off and and moved out, it became possible for me to go back to grad school after becoming a sex therapist, to become a sex neuroscientist. And that was driven by the incredible gaps in the literature about what we know about sexuality in general, specifically about the female sexual brain and also the male sexual brain. So we know a lot about arousal because people will study that. But when it comes down to actual genital sensory stimulation in the big O, Not too many, only two labs in the whole world would go there. So when you think about something as basic as where the sensations from the genitals go to the brain, that we didn't have any systematic exploration of this until we published a paper in 2011 when I was in graduate school. It's shocking. Mm -hmm. So basically what I think I bring to the table with this book is really understanding how our core wired in emotions which are neglected in psychology. We're very cognitive in psychology and we really deal with like kind of the higher kind of influenced emotions rather than really understanding the embodied emotions. When we know more about how our core emotional systems are wired and affected by whatever it is, genetics, experience, what we can do then is operate them better. Mm -hmm. And that missing piece is really what I bring to the to the table. The issue is a lot of people seem, seem to be having trouble with experiencing pleasure. Anhedonia, which is the inability to experience satisfying pleasure, as you know, as we all know, is a symptom of depression and anxiety, but it's also a cause of it also. So if you look at the rates of depression, depression is the number one cause of of um illness and disability in the world now. We are experiencing a pleasure crisis and sex is a window into our relationship with pleasure and beneath that, how well our emotional brains are working. So you mentioned pleasure a lot and your book is all about pleasure. So let's dive into that for a minute. What exactly is pleasure? You know, as a scientist, how do you define this concept? For example, is it a physical sensation? Is it a feeling? Is it a neurochemical response? Is it all of the above? How do you define pleasure? All of the above as defined by the experiencer of pleasure. Mm -hmm. So things like pain and pleasure, although we can do physiological measures, you know, we can look at heart rate, we can look at Pupil dilation, the best measure of pleasure or pain is the person's subjective experience of it. Mm -hmm. 
And that being said, one of the things that we miss, we're so pleasure sort of phobic in a way in this culture. It's very strange. Pleasure gets a bad rap. And the way that our brains are wired, it's really to seek things that feel good. And typically, if something feels good and is good for you, that kind of pleasure is what I call healthy hedonism. And we also, our, our brain bodies are wired to avoid things that are painful. And that's evolutionarily. These emotions serve survival functions as Yak Pengsep, who's the guy who mapped these circuits in the brain. They're electric. You can electrically stimulate them or chemically stimulate them, and you get that response mm -hmm. in animals and in people. So essentially, this is a whole part of psychology that I never was, I never learned about, even in graduate school. Psychology doesn't deal with the embodied emotions, and that may be part of our history of being what uh, Franz de Waal calls anthro-denial, mm -hmm. where we don't want to see ourselves the same as animals, and there's still people who talk about emotion and deny that animals have emotions. In the basement of the brain, their emotions are very similar to ours. They have the same systems. At the top of the brain, we're very different from animals, as Yak. Pankcep says. Mm -hmm. Now, in your book, you say that sex is always about pleasure, which is a line that I thought was interesting. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about what you mean by that? That's interesting. I don't remember saying that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, it comes from the part of the book where you talk about where you ask students in your classes to define what sex is and they're kind of all over the map in terms of what their definitions are. And you come down to saying that, you know, what cuts across all of their definitions is that it's pretty much always about pleasure. Well, we hope that sex feels good. Mm -hmm. Now there are, we know there are exceptions where people have pain associated either physically or experientially with um, sex but, you know, the real burning point there is that we don't even know sometimes what we're talking about when we say sex. It can mean different things. And it's very contextual. Like, that's the first conversation I have with my students. And they look at me like I'm crazy. <laughs> but, you know, it's like, is kissing sexual? No. Well, what if your partner is kissing someone else with the tongue? Oh, yeah, then it's sex. So, you know, even just bringing our mind towards sex, like, what do we mean by it? And I always say that expanding our notion of sex to include things that are pleasurable, that promote intimacy, that to look at sex as play, as connection, and get away from just defining it narrowly, you know, how our North American sex scripts are about, you know, you have to have, you know, intercourse with orgasms in all the right place. That's a cause, as Peggy Kleinplatz says, of a lot of our sexual dysfunction is these weird ideas that we have about sex. So even having a conversation, I'm struck to this day, now that I'm talking about this book, like I go out and people giggle, they get all uncomfortable. It's like amazing to me. You know, when you when you teach psychology students that want to know, they, they're really cool with it. If you deal with sex therapy clients, they want to talk about it. But going into the world and you see people's reactions to even having a conversation about sex, it's like it it sort of evokes so many emotions and discomfort that having the conversation and and really like um, validating that sexual pleasure and pleasure in general is not only OK, it's good for us mm -hmm. and finding those ways that feel good, sex that feels good and is good for us pleasures that feel good and are good for us, kind of like the way the nature wired our brains to respond, like good food that's good for us, tastes good, is good for us. Sex with appropriate partners in the right context feels good and is good for us. So. Yeah, I, I, I like what you said there. I think it, it demonstrates a couple of really important points. One being that attitudes towards sex today are still you know, sex is still this taboo topic and a lot of people don't know how to deal with it and they laugh and giggle. I, I had that experience on an airplane recently where I was blogging about sex and I thought I was doing it in a time when the person sitting next to me was asleep. But as soon as I started doing it, 
she perked up, started looking over, and then just started laughing for the entire rest of the flight. So I, I, I can relate. Shoulder? Yes. She's watching. Oh, my yes. goodness. It, it happens. Um, but, but I also liked what you said about how both, both sex and pleasure are these concepts that, you know, people don't necessarily agree on. There's not one universal definition of them. And so that's why we need to take these very expansive definitions and, and very much look at the individual uh, experience there. And key is the ability to experience pleasure with and through face-to-face, flesh-to-flesh interaction that does not necessarily involve genitals or friction, Mm -hmm. but connection. And what's happening is people are, it appears from a lot of the metrics now that people are finding their continuous partial attention with their devices is really robbing them of the ability to focus and connect. We're having less sex in general. You know, and it's really just a wake up call too that the way that we're wired as pleasure is not optional, it's a luxury, moves us towards things that can feel good and are good for us and away from things that are deleterious. Yeah, now that face to face component, we could have a whole side discussion there about how that's going to change going forward as more sexual interactions take place online. Um, but but I don't want to <laughs> hijack the conversation there. So I, I, let me turn back um, to, to some of your research that formed the basis for your book, because I've been reading about your research for years. And as some of the work that you've done, you have brought women into the lab and they have masturbated to orgasm in an fMRI machine so that you could see what's going on inside their brains when they're at the the peak of pleasure. And I'm sure people have lots of questions about how that research works and what you've learned from it. But but let me ask one question first that people always ask me when I talk about this kind of research in my classes and lectures is, how do you get people to come into the lab and uh, masturbate in an fMRI machine? That's the easiest part of the whole process. I have never had any problem with people getting people in. In fact, Masters and Johnson reported they got a lot of uh, volunteers. Um, I think, and we also just published a paper on men this month on a similar mapping paper and what happens in their brains is they actually have general stimulation or imagine general stimulation like I did in my paper. So the the short answer is we had lots of volunteers. And I think for the women in particular, you know, if you go back to when, you know, when I was a young person and you hear about people, women burning their bras is kind of like a liberation thing. I think women coming in to donate orgasms to science is like a a female sexual empowerment move. And just to show you how weird, even psychology academicians are, and maybe you know this personally. When I talked about this in one of my presentations during graduate school, a number of people asked me, are my participants, my subjects, exhibitionists? So their minds went right to that. And I also had people like kind of see me in the hallway and say things like, hey, sex maniac. Like they were spilling with their their being overstimulated and and having issues um, about sort of unexamined stuff about what they looked at, how they looked at sexuality. So the easiest part of the whole process was getting both female and male volunteers. The hardest part of it was working out the methodological challenges. Mm -hmm. Number one, head movement. When you move your head in an fMRI scanner, you completely mess up the data. So for somebody to either masturbate themselves, which was one condition, and the other condition was the woman was, um, her, her clitoris was stimulated by a partner, to try and do that while keeping the body and head still, that was about two years of work on my part to figure out how to design, which we did personally, a head restraint sort of uh, device that was comfortable enough to wear an fMRI compatible. So that was a big piece of it. The second piece is you have a lot of variability, like some people stimulated for 82 seconds and some people stimulated for 820 seconds. How do you, you know, and orgasms could be 10 seconds versus 60 seconds. 
So how do you use fMRI, which I had to learn how to do all of it from soup to nuts and learned it, which was a feat in of itself going into graduate school at the age of 50, but to figure out a way to sample the time point so it would be equivalent, which is what I did for the Journal of Sexual Medicine, the, the beginning stimulation, middle stimulation, and then right before the orgasm. So those are the two methodological things. Um, and other than that, it was a cakewalk because my, my participants were fantastic. The challenge also was it was much easier for women to self-stimulate into orgasm rather than to have a partner stimulate them. So for your lis listeners who aren't familiar, you know, think about when you've gone into a scanner for like even an MRI, you can't see or hear other people outside, never mind direct them. So the partner is reaching their hand into the scanner from underneath, from the like around the hips and masturbating the person without any feedback. So that was a little tough. So I didn't get as many of the partner-induced orgasms as the self-induced ones. But other, it was really a labor of love. It was The people were great. The experience was wonderful. People had a good time. They were helpful in, like, a, you know, partnering with me because we had to do a lot of piloting of the... T of the um, studies. I was a frequent flyer myself in the scanner, but then I had to study how people could do it with partners and all sorts of stuff. So, Yeah, that's really fascinating. And, uh, you know, the fact that getting participants is the easy part, I think, is something that will surprise a lot of people because I've gotten a lot of the same reactions as you. You know, I conducted a study of more than 4,000 people's sexual fantasies. And one of the most common questions I get is, how did you get 4,000 people to tell you about their fantasies? And that actually wasn't the hard part uh, in, in doing that kind of research. It's figuring out how do you ask the right questions and then what to do with the data and how to get them published. And it, it's, it's all of the methodological things, as you were saying, that are the real challenges, not as much getting the participants. I think people are very excited to contribute what they can, especially like my my uh, participants, the women, did not always. I did interviews of them, which is part of what kind of got me the idea of writing the book. So some of that shows up in my chapter, the last chapter, which is sexual potential, some of their stories. And for most of them, the kind of journey to becoming that comfortable in their own skin and that comfortable and confident in their sexual potential to come in, you know, squeeze out an orgasm in the least sexy place, which a scanner is, was really a journey that they learned a lot. They were intent on healing. So some of the stories of my participants really, uh, I think, bring that lesson home in the last chapter of the book. Right. One of my, well, I had an, a 74-year-old participant who was a grandmother who was amazing. She had an orgasm herself and, and one induced by a partner. And she was just, she'd been through so many sex negative things, you know, like kind of being raised in a convent and all of that. So what a, what a process for people for healing overall, not just about their sexuality. Getting back to your book, you talk about this long and complicated relationship we have with pleasure, and you talk about how we're experiencing less pleasure today than we used to. Uh, I know you hinted at this a little bit before when you talked about depression on the rise and, and the role that that can play in inhibiting pleasure. Um, but what else can you tell us about this? Why, why are we experiencing less pleasure? Why aren't we having more? And what can we do to, to change that? Well, and the simplest way to describe it is we're so, our attention is so divided that it disrupts the seeking system, which is powered by dopamine. That's the mesolimbic dopamine system, which people think of as the reward system, but that's really not the way we think about it now. It's really like our reinforcement signals. And we're so, that's so hijacked. Our attention is so hijacked across so many different things that we're not able to be present. And when we're not able to be present, we're not regulating emotions as well. And yes, I agree with you that the future, there's going to be maybe not face-to-face, flesh-to-flesh contact, but there's something innately wired into our care systems 
which is the, the fundamental affiliative system, where touch and closeness and skin hunger and connection is really vital to our well-being and play and social joy. If we don't have that system, if we don't feel safe and we don't feel relaxed, I think the shorter answer, and I thought I was given the shorter answer, but here's a shorter one, where <laughs> we're overstimulated. So what can we do to fix that? How do we become less stimulated so that we can experience more pleasure? What, what kind of advice or recommendations do you give to people in this regard? Well, first of all, I think when you understand how the core emotional systems are wired, and we understand how, for example, easily hijacked the seeking system can be. And if the seeking system is hijacked and we're getting all these little dopamine bumps from our social media pings and all of that, that affects our capacity to really feel satisfying pleasures. There's a difference between craving and wanting, which is mediated by those kind of seeking dopamine processes, which are meant to get us to pay attention to meet our needs. And our needs are really for connection, for care, for play, for lust, cooperation, you know, all of that sort of thing. And as a result, if we understand how that gets hijacked, we can be a little bit more intentional. Now, I use social media, I use devices, and I notice sometimes where when people are on those, when I'm paying attention to that, it kind of pulls you in and you want more and you want more. If you can learn to just be a mindful consumer of your social media, a mindful consumer of like we would your recreational drugs, your food stuff, so all of that, whatever you do, be mindful and prioritize pleasure and by when I say prioritizing pleasure is really for a lot of people is learning how to be attuned to the sensations in your body. What what you're saying reminds me of some research I've read on orgasms where people talk about how they can have good orgasms and not as good orgasms. I mean, yes, they're all orgasms and generally speaking, orgasms tend to feel good, but Maybe we could be having even better orgasms and more pleasure and better sex if we were more attuned and, and in the moment. So I think your advice is really kind of on how we can go from having good sex or acceptable sex to really having great sex. Well, you know, it's funny that you say that. I think in some ways, yes, we could have even better sex when we're present. But, you know, sometimes the, the great is the enemy of a good. If our mind is evaluating and trying to get the best sex, the most orgasms, takes us out of the moment. Good sex is, as I've written about, is about being connected. I talk about this in the book. It's about being present. It's about being playful. It's learning to see sex as the playground as opposed to, and I think as I wrote for Psychology Today about um, people as the, you know, sex as we age, that, you know, if you really recognize we can always do these things, maybe the metric is less about how long the sex lasts or how hard the penis is or how many orgasms. It's about being present and connected to self and other. And I take it back to the body. If I had a, a dime for every time I ask one of my clients what's going on in your body and they look at me like I'm crazy, we're heads on sticks. So being attuned to our where the core emotions are and how we're feeling and attuned to that, that's where sex becomes sensational. And when it's sensational and we're connected and we like, you know, enjoy connection, that's another kind of sex. It's not sex with genitals. It's more of that like, you know, energy exchange where you really enjoy connecting. We've forgotten to slow down and savor. So satisfying is a different story. And satisfying is not dopamine. Satis if dopamine satisfied, people wouldn't be clicking, 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 or drugging, drugging, drugging. They would be, it would be enough. Right. And, and that also gets back to what you were saying earlier about definitions of sex and the importance of expanding it. So it's not going into sex with this goal-oriented mindset of there's just 
this this one narrow thing means sex. It's taking this expansive view, exploring, playing, having fun, but being present and being in the moment is really the key uh, to to a pleasure filled sex life. Exactly, yeah. you you nailed it there, Justin. So, uh, just a couple of other questions. Um, do you have different advice for men and for women? I know you talk a little bit in your book about how there are sex differences, but has that does that inform the way that you advise men and women when it comes to how they approach sex? That's a great question. Um, I think some of what some of the differences may be more what I see may not so much well. One big thing is that women tend to lose their spontaneous sexual desire more frequently in long-term relationships where men, because they have more of those, um, the way their brains develop, they tend to have more circuits, more receptive fields for those, uh, uh, for vasopressin and testosterone in the brain. They have sex on the brain more. However, there's individual differences where some men lose their sexual desire, their active desire in long-term relationship. But the issue, I think, for men is the incredible amount of performance anxiety. Since, you know, men focus on the penis and the women, too, the penis getting hard and staying hard. And so I think for men where they're hindered, where they're hindered is once they get into what Masters and Johnson called spectatoring, is the penis hard? Is it going to stay hard? Am I going to be able to please my partner? Women probably are not more often thinking about that if they have spectatoring it's more about is their body okay do their does their body fit is there and a lot of women have negative feelings about their body but the i feel really bad for how when people and i think this is how it kind of shows up in my book when you have sensitive uh what they call the panic grief system where it's easily triggered, where you're going to be a little bit more anxious than the average bear in general. And then you have an experience where your penis is not cooperating. Then it can become like the, the it becomes a thing. Is the penis going to work? And then it feeds on itself. So because we are goal-directed when it comes to sex, women worry if the men's penises aren't working. or um, And I don't want to be heterosexual, centric about this people worry if a penis isn't working it's their fault meaning the person who's the penis isn't working for isn't hot enough isn't good enough you know we get into that and that's all the panic grief self-doubt kind of stuff that comes up those circuits get going and when that happens we're not uh, we're we're not able to be in the moment we're on the task which is the that will kill you know sexual fun it's like kids in the playground are playing they're in the flow of playing they're not thinking am i playing right is this good enough are people happy enough with my play if we can go into the just thinking about giving and receiving pleasure i even am writing now about how taking a nap together can be sex sexy for sleep deprived parents so they can take their mind out of sex being genitals and pleasure, you know, just sensational energy exchange, like cuddling and sleeping. That's pleasurable when you're sleep deprived. It is. And it's it's also pleasurable when you combine that with sex. You know, I'm reminded of some research showing that couples that that cuddle and spoon after sex, long term, they show increases in sexual satisfaction and relationship satisfaction. And so that really speaks to the importance of just having that intimate physical connection and just how it brings you closer and improves and builds relationships. And if you think about it, it's the core system of care that's mediated, wired into us by with the opioids and oxytocin and prolactin. That's the physiology of love. Now, I have one last question for you, which is about the the last chapter of your book where you talk about these extraordinary lovers you've encountered in your work. And these are all women who have volunteered to be in your research. And as you say, they volunteered to donate their orgasms to science. Uh, Can you tell us just a couple of the sort of key lessons you learned from observing these extraordinary lovers, things that somebody who's listening to this might be able to take away and apply in their own life? They all said one thing. Learn to love your body. 
learn to love your body as is. And I think that's a huge issue for people in general and women in particular. So once they learn to love their body and appreciate their bodies, I think they found it easier to play with their bodies. And I always tell people, if you don't know how to masturbate, you're not, if you can't play your own instrument, you can't play in a band, in a band. So, and for, for, I've seen for women because of some of the messages they get about kind of being too sexual or too mess, like somebody masturbates, like, you know, they learn that, that it's not good to touch yourself. So learn to really explore and love your body your body love what your body can do for you love for what, what you can do for your body and learn to enjoy the sensations of pleasure that your body can give to you Beverly Whipple who is my best friend in the world now I love Beverly to bits she's my mentor and my best friend she talked about the um play, the the Sounds that can give you pleasure, touches, ex, ex, extra genital touch, you know, things that give you pleasure. And part of our learning is that, you know, for many people, they have learned somehow that their bodies are not okay, their sexual experiences or what they've learned about sex, they're not okay, it's not okay. So it's really about learning to feel safe and warm and fuzzy about our bodies. That was number one for everybody. And I love that so much. And I think that's a, a great note to end on that one of the keys to pleasure or the key to pleasure is really learning how to love yourself and your body. And if you want to be in the band, you've got to play your instrument regularly. So, so thank you so much for your time, Dr. Wise. It was truly a pleasure to speak with you. Uh, so where can my listeners go if they want to learn more about you and your research? Well, the easiest place is my website, ask Dr. Nan, spelled out Dr. D-O-C-T-O-R-N-A-N. And there's all sorts of, um, you know, resources. I'm writing a column for Glamour now. I'm also doing a Psychology Today blog. Um, you know, my papers are there, an excerpt from the book. And, you know, I would say that we need to really get over this whole thing about, you know, sex somehow not being okay and really see pleasure, not just sexual pleasure, but pleasure as a necessary component of a healthy life, not a luxury. Couldn't agree more. So visit askdrnan.com and check out her new book, Why Good Sex Matters, which is available in stores now. Also be sure to check out my book, Tell Me What You Want, The Science of Sexual Desire and How It Can Help You Improve Your Sex Life, which I think makes great companion reading for Why Good Sex Matters if you're somebody who wants to better understand the science of sex and how to communicate your desires. Also check out my sex and psychology blog at sexandpsychology.com for updates on the latest and greatest sex research. Here's to having a future of great and very pleasure-filled sex. Thanks for listening.